the title, An Unintended Consequence. It's 2 a.m. Join me on the steps of the University of Michigan Student Union. A brief presidential campaign stop for Senator Kennedy three weeks before the 1960 election. He begins with wry Kennedy humor. As a graduate of the Michigan of the East, Harvard, I want to express my thanks to you for this opportunity. I think in many ways, this is the most important campaign since 1933. I think he should have said 32, no matter. Mostly because of the problems with press upon the United States and the opportunities that will be presented to us in the 1960s. The opportunity must be seized. JFK continues, how many of you who are going to be doctors are willing to spend your days in Ghana? Technicians, engineers, how many of you are willing to work in the foreign service, spend your lives traveling around the world? On your willingness to contribute a part of your life to this country will depend the answer whether a free society can compete. And he concluded, it's about 10 after 2 a.m. at this point, the purpose of this university is not merely to help its graduates have an economic advantage in the life struggle. There is certainly a greater purpose. And I come here tonight asking for your support for this country. And it is that greater purpose for the country and for this college that brings us together today. Dartmouth's role in a shared Peace Corps experience. Four months after his Michigan speech on March 1, 1961, Newly inaugurated President Kennedy signed Executive Order 10924, the official birthday of the Peace Corps, and appointed his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, as you all know, to be the first director. The White House was swamped with calls, telegrams, letters. But 12 days later, on WGBH TV, in the program Prospects of Mankind, Eleanor Roosevelt interviewed the President about his plan to send volunteer youth to all corners of the globe. What shape shall it take? Those details were left to Shriver. An inspired choice, he quickly assembled a superb team. Size, his program director Warren Wiggins had a, written a paper, a towering task, posited 2,000 volunteers to Mexico, 10,000 to Nigeria, 50,000 to India, 17,000 teachers to the Philippines. Admirable, unrealistic goals. Speed, two years to craft a new federal agency. It took Shriver six weeks. Autonomy, thanks to intervention by Vice President uh, Johnson, who persuaded President Kennedy that the Peace Corps was too popular to let it be tarnished by the unpopular foreign aid program. Shriver won that crucial battle for a Peace Corps independent of the new Agency for International Development, AID. I find up here, ah, so give me a moment. I've been, I've been listening to all you on the panel and I haven't had a chance to take a little drink, which I want to do. Pardon me. Moreover, as a former Peace Corps evaluator, Stanley Miser Prince points out in his inside story of the Peace Corps, its first 50 years, at that point in time, Congress had yet to pass any Peace Corps legislation, confirm Shriver as director, or appropriate any of the necessary funds. With Shriver's remarkable energy and charm and this dazzling grasp of detail, he was masterful in wooing Congress. He met almost 400 senators and representatives individually, mostly for breakfast at the Congressional Hotel. And admiring President Kennedy later called his brother-in-law the most effective lobbyist in Washington. But as Miser in his book makes clear, the Peace Corps that emerged in that summer of 1961 was Sarge's Peace Corps. 
Public support was not guaranteed. Skepticism came from diverse sources. CBS's Eric Severod dismissed the Peace Corps as pure intentions supported by pure publicity. The cynics ridiculed the Peace Corps idea, a children's crusade, a kiddie corps, a beatnik's boondockle, <laughs> a haft, a haven for draft dodgers. Not to be outdone, not to be out, a New, York, New Yorker story leavened the debate with dismissive humor. A 52-year-old self-pitying advertising man bungles a suicide and decides instead to join the Peace Corps. <laughs> In 1961, I had no thought either of suicide or joining the Peace Corps. <laughs> I was new to the Dartmouth administration, and I had much to learn. With daughters aged three and two, my wife Phoebe and I were getting our bearings in Hanover. Thanks to a college uh, mortgage assistance subsidy, we had just purchased our first home. No doubt influenced by Peace Corps media hype, at winter term registration, I inserted a brief questionnaire asking students whether they might be interested in this Peace Corps service. And almost as an afterthought, I forwarded the results to Washington. Some 850 of the 2,600 Dartmouth students had responded positively. The next thing I knew, I received a call asking if two Peace Corps representatives might visit this presumed recruiting gold mine and talk <laughs> with prospective Dartmouth volunteers. And they sent up two of the most senior staff persons, Harris Wofford, former dean of law at, uh, at Notre Dame, and you may know the name later on as a senator from Pennsylvania, Harris Wofford and Bill Delano, who was the, the, uh, the attorney for the Peace Corps at that time. They spent two days interviewing on campus. And before departing, I'm, I'm walking with them down past the green, and they turn to me, and they stop, and they say, would you be willing to serve? Sergeant Shriver, they said, believed that college deans, accustomed to the unexpected, were just what he needed to ride herd on volunteers in unfamiliar, challenging circumstances. Of more immediate interest to me were the ways in which the Peace Corps might relate to liberal education. Mine as well as the Dartmouth students. For two years as a dean, I'd been trying to guide undergraduates who were seeking study and service and work opportunities overseas. Lacking direct personal experience and from the comfort of a Parkhurst office, who was I to encourage that kind of adventuring? Dean of the college, Thad Seymour, and President John Sloan Dickey came to my rescue. They made possible the necessary leave of absence, as did my intrepid wife, Phoebe, though it was some months before she discovered just what she'd agreed to. <laughs> Is Binswanger here? Wait, oh, okay, thank you. More, more importantly, I hope your wife is here. While I was in Puerto Rico for orientation, I never did discover what outward bound drown proofing and rainforest survival had to do with my looming Peace Corps responsibilities. We have here with us a distinguished guest and classmate of mine, and uh, he was a senior training officer for Peace Corps at the time. And at some point, maybe you'll ask him what I was doing in the rainforest, supposing to, with, with leaves and spending the night on the ground and all that sort of thing out there, what that had to do. Now, while I was there, my wife, Phoebe, was rolling up her sleeve in the doctor's office, assuring our daughters that the typhoid shots would not hurt. When she passed out, <laughs> our three-year-old shouted, you killed my mommy. <laughs> holding a reviving mommy, the accused nurse murderer, <laughs> unflappably inquired, you don't think you're pregnant, do you? Of course not, Phoebe answered, with calm assurance. A sacrificial rabbit soon confirmed that our third child would indeed be a Peace Corps baby. <laughs> now at that moment, a wiser, more prudent husband would have said to Mr. Shriver, I'm sorry, find somebody else. But my wife, a committed and courageous soul, wouldn't think of not going. If not for her, someone else would be standing here. A month later from Newark, New Jersey, we boarded a plane headed for the Philippines by way of Chicago and San Francisco and Hawaii, Tokyo, Okinawa, then to Manila. Now, in sharing, sharing our family experiences with you, I do so 
with, uh, with great humility and enormous admiration for volunteers. Those of you who placed yourselves at risk in the unknown, and as this panel so ably demonstrated, any one of you might be standing in my place, describing in terms far more immediate your own unique experiences, as we just heard from these wonderful people. But my role is to convey a different perspective, not as a volunteer, but as a staff person, responsible for the well-being of 80 volunteers scattered over some 400 square miles of southern Luzon and the nearby islands of Masbati and Catanduanas. They were part of the pioneering Philippines Group 1, the third group to be sent overseas following Ghana and Nigeria. My responsibility was to see them through their second year in the field. In August of 1962, when our 707 hit the runway of the Vanilla Inter Manila International Airport, the temperature had to be at least 120 degrees. As we came down the portable stairs, my first thought was, what a mistake. What colossal misjudgment. The only question was how soon I could get my pregnant wife and daughters back to the States. That night, an air-conditioned hotel room partially restored my equanimity. A few days later, we flew into Legaspi City, the provincial capital of Albay Province, Bicol region, southern Luzon. Henceforth, we would be known as Bicolanos. While awaiting his replacement, my predecessor, an anthropology professor, Dr. Kip, had been living in a barrio gathering material for his next book. Not knowing any better, we moved into his one room, thatched roof, bamboo and nipa hut on stilts. Mats for sleeping, goats bleeding under the floor, nightly mosquitoes, daily red ants, preparing meals without running water or refrigeration, answering nature's calls in the gobby patch. For us, the novelty quickly eroded. <laughs> for the locals, the novelty was hilarious. <laughs> Watching me, pail in hand, a daughter under each arm, dancing my way to the community faucet as huge geese pecked fiercely at my white legs. <laughs> we promptly retreated to plan B. This time, however, rather than booking for the States, we moved into a reasonably modern house in Legaspi City that served not only our family, but provided a Peace Corps office and quarters for visiting volunteers. Uh, the guest quarters were a response to early vibrations. Group one, having been in the field a year, had suffered all the frustrations, hardships that typically shadow pioneers. Much of their early idealism had been tempered by local realities and the greater realization they were not going to bring large changes to their barrios. And even if they could, by their second year, many questioned whether morally, as transients, they should. They were too far along for major changes to be initiated by a new staff person. My task was more a question of how to sustain morale and with the end in sight how to ensure a strong finish. Ranging in age from 18 to 60, most were liberal arts graduates, assigned as educational aides, a job never, never, never clearly defined and therefore left to the imagination and creativity of individual volunteers. The results had defied simplistic categorization. Those most successful had achieved personal relationships within their barrios that made possible joint successes, a basketball court, a school library, a fresh water system, speaking of water. Some relied on their boxes of paperbacks sent to early volunteers by Peace Corps Washington to fill the empty hours and to be shared locally. Other unsolicited goods were totally inappropriate. One volunteer describes the arrival. They came in a crate so large it couldn't fit into the house and we had to open it outside with everybody, everyone in town watching. Inside were such wonderful things as a set of Noritake china, fitted bed sheets, car wax, and, and best of all, utter wipers, all assembled from the USAID warehouse. At times, life seemed a never-ending series of personal setbacks. Whether the issues were physical, mental, interpersonal, job-related, or puzzling combinations, the emergencies were real, solutions elusive. 
unreliable phone connection to Peace Corps headquarters in Manila and erratic Western Union transmission made professional backup hugely difficult. My wife and I can still hear the shouted pleas, come, come, hurry, from the neighboring church. The volunteer, having removed all of her clothes, was carrying them down the aisle on the offering plate. In the few minutes it took to get from our house to the church, sensitive caring persons had her wrapped in a blanket. Fortunately, the Peace Corps doctor and Air Force evacuation team responded with reassuring alacrity, bringing a large four-engine aircraft safely down on a partial grass landing strip. And when, the trips, when the chips were down, Uncle Sam delivered. That heartbreaking event ended the Peace Corps career of one of our most successful volunteers. She had taken seriously her training and mission, learn the local language, immerse yourself in the culture, Adhere as closely as possible to the ways of your host. Subordinate yourself as you help others to help themselves. She did it all. In retrospect, one cannot but wonder whether the depth of her commitment ultimately put her, her American moorings at risk. Other challenges involve personal relationships. When a volunteer told me she wanted to marry a Filipino, I drew on all my... Dartmouth counseling skills as a dean to persuade her to return home to Nebraska. Likely she had simply lost her bearings and just needed time. If after six months she still wanted to marry him, she would have my full support. Peace Corps Washington had other ideas. No, she can't go home. Me, what do you mean she can't go home? Well, if volunteers come home, that makes us look bad. And we're trying to get Congress to approve a larger budget for next year's expansion. We can't have volunteers coming home. I said, so you're putting Peace Corps needs before the welfare of this young lady. That's all wrong. I was upset. I fought. I lost. The next thing I knew, as surrogate father of the bride, our daughters as flower girls, <laughs> with huge misgivings, I gave her away in marriage. This past September at our Philippine uh, Group 150th reunion in Washington, there they were. <laughs> he retired Cal State professor. She an accomplished educator and entrepreneur. They, parents of five high achieving offspring, the youngest of whom is a member of the Harvard football team, helped defeat Dartmouth. <laughs> So, so much for my knowing what was right for her, <laughs> and so much for Shriver thinking that college deans in the field would know how best to handle the unexpected. <laughs> because it took me more than two months to visit all of the 80 volunteers I was supposed to be helping, I spent much of my time on buses and jeepneys. My attempts at low-key low school visits were routinely thwarted. In rural barrios, the arrival of the Peace Corps boss, or in Tagalog, the Kwan, that was a big deal. A formal welcoming ceremony by the principal and merienda food and drink, showcasing, showcasing the immaculate students in classrooms and gardens, and repetitive declarations reassuring me how much they appreciated having the volunteers. Nothing about the job. Only later in follow-up conversations with volunteers would I hear the details about their lack of work. Administrators uncertain what to do with them. The uh, teachers easily threatened by volunteer initiatives. Science equipment, lovely. World War II Japanese reparations, all locked up in the cabinets. They'd only open them for inspection when it was a visiting dignitary, so I got to look at some of those microscopes. Then they closed them back up. Volunteers were perceived as friendly additions to the barrio to be fussed over, not as serious workers. Back in Legaspi, we faced different issues. Being light-skinned Anglos in a dark-skinned society was only the beginning. A major local employer, the American-owned Copra Corporation, was non-unionized. At the shipping dock, long lines of barefoot laborers dressed in little shorts, Copra sacks slung over their shoulders, would tread up steep, narrow wood planks to the cargo ships, then down again, in endless circuits repeated throughout the day. 
for pennies. That I was a field rep under the State Department with strict instructions to steer clear of local politics meant little to that earnest coper worker sitting in my office seeking help. Describing abysmal working conditions and lack of benefits, he entreated, could I not assist his efforts to organize a union? After all, unions were permitted in America, and the Peace Corps was sent to help Filipinos. That was not one of my better days. As were the encounters with those less fortunate who saw well-off Americans as targets. Our houseboy, who shot himself accidentally while hunting, returned to our house for help. Phoebe takes him to the hospital, pays his bill. She thought nothing further of it. Some days later, after he'd returned to work, he and our camera, with pictures of our newborn, had disappeared. Andrew will never see those pictures of him with us today. Actually, Andrew was born exactly on March 1, 1963, in the Philippines, two years to the day after uh, Kennedy issued his executive order. Yeah. That's not written here, I just thought of it. <laughs> Less uh, personal but equally discouraging were the scams by bill collectors. A prime example was the monthly visit from the electric company representative who never tired of seeking cash payments for bills previously paid by Peace Corps Manila. Or the most egregious example, our expensive box of indigenous handmade hats sent to the Thad Seymour and his family. Only some time later did we discover that although we had paid for the shipping in advance, it arrived at Seymour's house, COD, collect on delivery. Thad still hopes for reimbursement <laughs> with interest. Although their end game transitions varied, most volunteers were remarkably resilient. In comments requested by the Dartmouth Alumni Magazine for the May 1963 Peace Corps article, I wrote from Legaspi, whatever the shortcomings almost to a person, the 80 volunteers in this region, knowing what they now know, would again volunteer for service with the Peace Corps. They might choose a smaller program, they might hold out for a more clearly defined role, but they would endorse the learning opportunity as simply fantastic. And I added, I fervently hope that upon completion of their Peace Corps service, these people will be allowed to return quietly to the usual walks of life in their towns and cities all across the nation, not as returning heroes, but as ordinary citizens who have had the good fortune to share an extraordinary experience. Those 1963 musings were reassuringly, reassuringly affirmed in the recently published Philippine Group One 50-year reunion book, answering Kennedy's call. And they all felt they were just personal, in 1961, personal extensions of John Kennedy, pioneering the Peace Corps in the Philippines. Two volunteers, Dartmouth Parker Borg, 61, a distinguished foreign service officer, and the first returned volunteer to become an ambassador, and Maureen Carroll, subsequent director of Peace Corps Africa and director of Peace Corps Alumni Foundation for Philippine Development. Those two did a remarkable job in compiling and editing 110 retrospective essays. Their reflections five decades later are filled with humility about things not achieved, mistakes made, questionable impact on others, but are as well sure-handed descriptions of the indelible impact on themselves and their subsequent lives. Maureen's personal essay deftly captures the essence of the Peace Corps as a simple and powerful idea. Americans leave home for two years, live at intimate levels among people very different from themselves, try hard to be useful in their communities, seek nothing in return, but understanding and friendship. And come home worldwide, world wise, and changed forever. It's a magnificent summary. But what of Peace Corps influence on higher education, and most particularly Dartmouth? Upon our return to Hanover in 1963, Dartmouth's engagement with the Peace Corps had begun in earnest. That summer, under the creative direction of Spike Chamberlain, our Dean of Summer Programs, the Peace Corps training program had prepared 35 students for teaching in Guinea, West Africa. The instruction was almost entirely in French by what the Peace Corps then called 
the immersion, immersion method, likely stealing uh, John's uh, phrase uh, early in the game. Sergeant Shriver was thrilled. He wrote President Dickey that the results from the intensive French language training represents the best effort to date. This program may well become a model for future Peace Corps training programs. The Dartmouth staff thought no, uh-uh. In their view, the trainees were not ready to go to Guinea. The trainees knew nothing about Africa, Guinea, or cross-cultural differences. They knew nothing about French colonial history. They knew nothing about the French lycée system in which they were going to teach. They had no teaching experience. So Dartmouth responded differently. They said, look, we'll design a two-summer training program. The project gave 100 to 200 college students their first summer of Peace Corps training at Dartmouth, after which they returned to their own colleges for their senior year. Following summer, they returned to Dartmouth again, continued their French instruction, and to study the specific country to which they were headed. Professor Rossius, chairman of uh, Romance Languages at University of Bridgeport, was recruited and appointed language coordinator with a staff of 10 to 20 French instructors. Anyone in your family who didn't receive a job that summer, uh, John? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Said Shriver, by lengthening our training program and building part of it into the curriculum during the training senior year, we're getting deeper into the life of the college. And a deeper, longer-term relationship was exactly what Dartmouth wanted. Time and opportunity for greater institutional integration and faculty involvement. But that euph euphoria was short-lived. By 1966, for reasons unrelated to Dartmouth, Peace Corps Washington was shifting from teachers to well diggers, chicken farmers, community development. Increasingly, they were using non-academic organizations for training, including greater use of Peace Corps in-house and in-country training. Binz, you were responsible for all of that. You're nodding yes, aren't you? I want the blame to go to the right place here. He is such an accomplished, great human being. We, we are, we've been close. We've been friends for how many years? 65? Something like that. Since 1948, anyway. But that euphoria, euphoria was short-lived, and for these reasons, increasing all of that stuff. And then, because they were operating on a year-to-year -year budget, Peace Corps did not have the flexibility for long-term contracts, and that really made Spike Chamberlain upset. So, Dean Chamberlain's accrued frustration was such that he sent President Dickey a very strongly worded memo, ending with the phrase, this is to recommend that Dartmouth terminate its Peace Corps relationship. John Dickey, former State Department official and stalwart internationalist, was not about to give up on a deeper Peace Corps involvement. Two days later, he returned Spike's memo with a penciled note at the bottom in that very strong John Dickey hand, reversed by JSD, Peace Corps to Tucker Foundation. Once more, my life was rearranged by an unintended consequence. Earlier that fall, the Tucker Foundation dean, a minister, had resigned. Deciding to roll the dice with a non-ordained person, President Dickey offered me the deanship and I accepted. A position I would later characterize for me, the best job in higher education. John Dickey saw cross-cultural experience and service as essential components of a modern liberal arts education. He took immense pride in the large number of Dartmouth students in the Peace Corps, students and alum. In that 1966, 67 year, seven year that school year, 66 seniors, nearly 10% of the senior class had applied for Peace Corps service. The national average among college seniors, other institutions, 1%. Under the Tucker Foundation, Peace Corps programs were directed by an enormously talented visionary educator. Enough's been said about you, I'm gonna mention somebody else. <laughs> Dr. Philip Bosserman and Rossius and Bosserman, that was a team. Of the 72 college and university training programs, Dartmouth was the first to have a Peace Corps director assigned permanently to a college campus. In addition to planning the training programs and counseling students, Bosserman was also charged with developing ways for integrating the programs into the fabric of the year-round academic community. By the summer of 1967, from Hanover, Bosserman and Rossius were operating five separate programs at seven different, seven different sites throughout North America and Africa. Volunteers received their initial training on campus. Then they were dispersed. 
Teachers for French-speaking Africa went to Quebec, to Providence, St. Louis. Public health workers went to Louisiana, Miami, Indian reservations, agricultural trainees to Jamaica, Trinidad, and Grenada. Poultry farmers for India went to a poultry farm in Versha, Vermont. I hope my two, our two granddaughters from India heard that. School construction workers for Gabon to offshore islands near Beaufort, South Carolina. Those were heady days. In Bosserman's words, Dartmouth College became concretely involved in the world. What effect, if any, would this expanded involvement have on the larger world? The final chapter of Meisler's Peace Corps history addresses this question more broadly in the, in the chapter title, Does the Peace Corps Do Any Good? When I asked a close friend and educator who spent the large, large part of his career with a major Midwest foundation how they judge outcomes, he replied, we begin with the so what test. If we fund a proposal, what will be different? What's our investment likely to produce? Will there be wealth, worthwhile, verifiable outcomes? Using those criteria, how might Peace Corps measure up? Invariably, there were overstatements, particularly in the early days. Speaking to religious leaders, Shriver proclaimed, we believe the success of the Peace Corps is due to the fact that thousands of Americans are willing to take personal responsibility for bringing peace to the world. Now, now a, more, a more modest so what? <laughs> Might begin with number of toilets installed, or water lines run, or seedlings planted, libraries, healthcare initiatives to lessen the scourges of malaria, polio, and other infectious diseases. Far more difficult to capture, however, is the tangible effect of educational aids in the community, no less than in the classroom. But as one evaluator did point out, though Peace Corps has its share of failure, the best volunteers do, do accomplish a kind of magic that is not, ca not caught by statistics. Another so what measure might be Miser's list of subsequent high-profile careers. The numbers are impressive. Two senators, dozens of congressmen, 20 ambassadors. Former volunteers in the media include novelist Paul Thoreau, journalist Chris Matthews, New Yorker writer George Packer, correspondents NPR Laura Jenkins and ABC News, Karen DeWitt, and many others. Also on Miser's list includes 10 presidents of universities and colleges, founders of Netflix and The Nature Company, board chairs of corporations as diverse as Levi Strauss and the Chicago Bears. But even Miser's citing of impressive accomplishments is but a partial response to so what? No one can readily quantify the value to our society and beyond of 200,000 citizens who have inhabited other cultures, cultures at their neediest for the equivalent of 400,000 years. That unmeasurable reality may be the greatest, most consequential value of the entire enterprise. Closer to home, Phoebe and I will be ever grateful for relationships with so many volunteers of various ages and backgrounds, caring and courageous fellow citizens giving of themselves to others. Had the pioneering Peace Corps groups, the ones and twos, had they not had the personal qualities necessary to surmount the frustrations and disappointments of their early service, we would not be celebrating a Peace Corps 50 years later. In assembling these recollections, I fully expected that revisiting personal and Dartmouth Peace Corps history would leave me with better understanding and generate renewed enthusiasm. Thanks to enormously helpful assistance by Mary Donan and her associates at the Rauner Library for Special Collections, it did both. What I did not expect was quite another consequence, escalating anger. Now, I'm not by nature given to extreme language, but in truth, Juxtaposing 1961 Peace Corps idealism with our 2011 national climate makes me furious. Self-aggrandizement, treacherous dishonesty, unmitigated greed, gross incivility, 
all compound my fury. What have we wrought? Political warfare masquerading as governance, holding hostage America's well-being. Where is our national conscience? 60 years ago, in his 1951 Atlantic Monthly article entitled Competence and Conscience, John Dickey outlined his vision for the Tucker Foundation. Name for Dartmouth's last preacher president, renowned 19th century theologian William Jewett Tucker. Prominently displayed on the foundation wall, carved in wood by Phoebe, is Dr. Tucker's oft-quoted admonition. Do not expect that you will make any lasting impression on the world through intellectual power without the use of an equal amount of conscience and heart. It's that conscience and undaunted idealism that is America at its best. In John Dickey's words, we must never be free from knowing the unfinished business of our society and how right he was and how right President Kim is with that same focus on service beyond self. To launch this academic year, President Kim chose as his convocation speaker, Nepali Kul Chandra Gautam. Did I pronounce that right, Gautam? <laughs> Class of 72, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of UNICEF. Through global health initiatives, often against horrendous odds, he and his team have saved more than 250 million lives. Cole Chandra called upon Dartmouth students to, quote, transform yourselves into true citizens of the world. Introducing the speaker, President Kim emphasized that despite witnessing some of the worst atrocities of the last half century, Cole's optimism and hopefulness for a better world have never been stronger. He understands that you do not become optimistic by looking at the evidence. Optimism, you see, is a moral choice. End of that quote from President Kim. Then to the students, Dr. Kim both promised and challenged. We will work with you tirelessly, tirelessly to develop your analytic skills so that your intellect will be wonderfully and appropriately pessimistic. Nurturing the optimism of your spirit is your task. Indeed, it is your duty. Now that kind of inspired leadership not only assuages my fury, but affirms, it affirms that within this Dartmouth generation, there is hope. The same 1961 hope that launched a Peace Corps. The Emily Dickinson hope that perches in the soul and sings its song and never stops at all. <laughs>